Happy Halloween. My name is Marisa Gomez. I am the Public Programs Manager at the Santa Cruz Museum of Natural History, and I'm incredibly excited to have uh, this presentation today with our dear friend Alex Crone, who is the Assistant Director of the Kenneth S. Norris Center for Natural History. This is part of our lineup of events called Museum of the Macabre, and for those of you who are friends of the museum, you know that this is one of our favorite seasons. We love um, getting the opportunity to explore uh, the darker side of our natural world in a variety of ways. And this year, um, because of current circumstances, we're able to explore new avenues of doing that, which is um, pretty exciting. So today we are kicking off a week of events um, and we're gonna be exploring something that is a bit macabre, uh, the art of taxidermy where we look closely at things that have died, which is uh, kind of the definition of what is macabre, but also taxidermy is a really important tool for museums, for preservation, for education. And uh, we're streaming in from Santa Cruz, uh, or at least I'm streaming in from Santa Cruz, uh, the home of the Santa Cruz Museum of Natural History. And uh, we are lucky to be in a community that has multiple natural history museums. We are full of people in this community who really um, love nature and love learning about nature. And so we are grateful to have our partners in the Kenneth S. Norris Center for Natural History, which is um, the Natural History Museum up at the UC Santa Cruz campus. And we partner with them regularly, including every year for our Museum of the Macabre event where, um, students from the Norris Center who learn the art of taxidermy uh, demonstrate what they're learning at the museum. They present live taxidermy in the middle of our party, <laughs> which is uh, one of our favorite things that we put on every year. Um, but this year we are lucky to have the person who teaches those students how to do taxidermy teach us how to do taxidermy. So at this point, I'm gonna welcome in our presenter who is Alex Crone from the Norris Center. Hi, Alex. Hi, everyone. Welcome, thanks for um, being here with us, Alex. And where are you joining us from? Um, this is obviously uh, sunny North Carolina. Uh, <laughs> no, just kidding. This is Baja, California, but um, I am in central North Carolina now for just for, for two months and we'll be back in Santa Cruz in December. Well, in the meantime, we miss you, but um, that's also one of the great things of this new way of doing things where we can still have you um, from exactly. afar, even while you're enjoying North Carolina. So um, today you've got a lot planned for us. We're gonna have a slideshow. We're also gonna be looking at a dissection, maybe not live, it's recorded footage, um, but just a warning for those uh, joining us today that you will be watching an acorn woodpecker be dissected. Uh, and we are also gonna be recording this. So, um, you know, take notes today and write your questions in the chat so that uh, Alex can, um, can directly help you with uh, anything that you're, you're looking for in your own maybe taxidermy hobby or just your own interest in the, in the subject. Um, but there will also be a recording so you can go back and dig into this later. But without further ado, Alex, why don't you take it away? Sure, thanks. Um, let's see, point. Okay. Um, all right. So I'm going to go over the basics of taxidermy with all of you. Um, and we'll kind of start um, by just going over um, the, the laws about taxidermy in California, um, which actually are more like the laws about working, um, collecting plants and animals and fungi and all of that. Um, then I'll go into kind of the general principles to keep in mind. I can't go over the minutia of like how to taxidermy everything you see. Um, but I guess, first of all, I should, should use some terms. So taxidermy is like the process of um, creating one of those mounted creatures uh, that you see. And really what you're doing is you're preserving uh, the, the bodily parts of that organism so that they'll last for a really long time. And so really I'll talk about general preservation principles um, when it, as, as it pertains to, to living tissues. And then we'll dive into birds, which is kind of ironic because 
you almost certainly will not be able to taxidermy birds yourself. Um, but uh, they are the co most common thing that we taxidermy at the Norris Center. Um, and, and yeah, that's where we'll go into the video and we'll, we'll talk about all the individual steps. And to be fair, they do, they apply to a bunch of other things as well, as you'll learn. Okay. Um, so first the laws pertaining to, um, collecting animals in California and doing what you will with them. One of the things you could do is, um, taxidermy. So essentially the only things that you can legally taxidermy yourself uh, as it pertains to vertebrate animals are the things that you can collect with a hunting or fishing license. Um, and so that is a variety of things. If you, are, um, if you are a hunter, for example, and you go out and you shoot a buck, it is, very, um, it is legal for you to taxidermy it yourself and, um, and you know, display the head on your wall or do whatever, whatever you would like. But um, that also applies to like fish that you would collect. Um, you can collect reptiles and amphibians with a fishing license. Um, and there's a whole slew of other mammals as well. Um, some things that you definitely cannot collect. So for example, it's outlawed just because it's a mammal that, and doesn't mean you can get a hunting license for it essentially. Like um, mountain lions, for example, you cannot hunt in the state of California. Um, other than that, and then and then all, all migratory birds, except for a few waterfowl species, are illegal to hunt, period, in all of the United States, including California. Um, if you wanted to take your taxidermy and, um, and display it for educational purposes or um, collect an organism, from the wild to taxidermy for ex for um, at, to then exhibit for educational purposes, you would need a scientific collecting permit, um, and that that can that's for example what the Norris Center has, and that's what allows us to collect organisms from all over the state um, as long as they are dead already. That's called salvaging them, um, and and bring them back to the museum and display them for scientific research or educational purposes. Um, we do that under a scientific collecting permit. You can apply for one as a private citizen. Um, it's, a, it's a bit onerous, um, but if it's something you wanna talk more about, I'm, I'm happy to, to talk with you about it. Um, it is not legal to salvage roadkill without, uh, without proper permits, without an, an SCP, a scientific collecting permit in California. There was, I was even confused about this. Um, there was a law that was passed in 2019 and there was a bunch of news stories that were like now you can eat things off the road and that's that's not true um you the law basically allowed cow fish and wildlife to set up a framework such that so that californians could eventually harvest roadkill mostly big game animals as food but that current that law does not actually exist right now. Um, stay tuned; it might be coming. Um, as I was saying before, certain permits, certain animals are very hard to get permits for. Even if you find them dead on the ground, you need more permits to be able to take them home and taxidermy them. Uh, for example, mountain lions. They California is one of the only states that, or one of the only Western states that doesn't allow hunting of mountain lions, which is a good thing, I think. Um, and you can't, even if you find a dead one, you can't take it home. Um, eagles are another um, protected uh, group of species that it is illegal for you to own any part of, period. Um, migratory birds are protected under the Migratory Bird Treaty Act. So um, if a songbird comes and hits your window, you can't take that home and taxidermy it. Um, literally, even if you find a feather on the ground in the woods, that's a violation of the Migratory Bird Treaty Act, and, and you can't take that home, um, just so we're clear. Sorry to be a stick in the mud here. Um, and that also, thankfully, applies to endangered species. Um, and so that's everything from like Ohlone tiger beetles in California or in Santa Cruz to red legged frogs, and, um, and but also uh, international endangered species like tigers or. Um, these birds of paradise that uh, are at the California Academy of Sciences. And so these were 
um, taxidermied, I think over 150 years ago, and they're now kind of grandfathered in. Um, but that is not something that you can go out and collect and taxidermy yourself without a whole heck of a lot of permits, which is a good thing, I think. Um, plants, fungi, and insects have less regulations about them. Um, but in general, if they're not a protected species, you can pretty much go for it. Um, protected species are endangered species like the Smith's blue butterfly or the Ohlone tiger beetle. Um, also vernal pool species, any species associated with a vernal pool, plant, insect, whatever, um, or arthropod, uh, those are protected. Um, California Fish and Wildlife has a list of rare plants as well um, that you are not allowed to, uh, to take. Um, and, and yeah, that, that generally that collecting intelligently is, is really important because if, if everyone went out and even collected just dead things that they found, there would be less things for scavengers, for decomposers. If people were going out and killing things wantonly without any permits, that would be bad. So these rules are for the benefit of California, for society as a whole. Um, and it's important that you know what is allowed and what is not allowed. Um, so even if you um, are collecting poison oak to taxidermy or collecting a chanterelle to, um, to taxidermy, there are no protections for those species, but you do still need to have landowner permission. So you can't go out onto state parks and um, state parks land and collect uh, species without a permit um, or specimens without a, a special permit. Those permits are often pretty easy to get. Um, especially for common mushrooms and plants, but you still need them. Same with park service and forest service and all that, um, and those lands as well. Be careful, know the regulations of where you are. Okay, general taxidermy principles. So this is again, general ways to preserve living tissues so that you can display them and so that um, they won't degrade over time. And the general idea is that you wanna remove anything that fungi, bacteria, or animals would want to eat. Um, those are your major degraders. And if you were to store this thing in a vacuum uh, without fungi, bacteria, or animals, um, and water really, because there's bacteria all over everything, um, the, the, the animal would be pretty preserved, but we don't live in a vacuum and we're constantly bombarded by fungal spores and bacteria and we've got rats in our buildings. And so there, we need to basically remove all the fat and all the water from, uh, from the, the things that we're working on. And then you can end up with crazy taxidermy displays like this one here, which was done by a taxidermy wizard. Um, that's not his official term, but um, it was done by uh, Richard Gurney, who's based in Watsonville. And I'm not gonna talk much about his technique, but essentially he freeze dries specimens, which is very odd, not a, not a typical way of preserving things, but he puts things inside a freezer, inside a vacuum that sublimates, basically um, sucks off all of the water in the creature. So I think this is a Parsons chameleon and um, all of the internal organs are, are inside here. They've just been dried out. And so he'll put wires through, um, through the legs and through the tail, and in this case through the tongue, which is just nuts. Um, and then freeze dry it in place and that will hold it. And it, they're remarkably well-preserved. They won't degrade. Um, basically, as long as you can prevent rats from getting to them, they will last a really, really long time. And um, so I even put that as a general taxidermy principle. Um, take your taxidermy to Richard Gurney. He is a master, he knows a ton of stuff um, and he's very willing to show other people in pre-COVID times, the taxidermy crew went down to Watsonville to watch him um, taxidermy a or freeze dry um, a rosy finch. And it was really, really impressive. Um, you should go. He is a legend. And he's like, what, 20 minutes away from, um, from Santa Cruz, from the Santa Cruz Museum of Natural History. So go check it out. Go say hi to Richard. He's a good guy. Um, so in general, um, birds and mammals are skinned and stuffed. And so that basically involves removing all of the internal organs, all the muscle, all the fat, all the bones for the most part, and then um, putting the skin over something. And so here are the molds or 
forms or mounts. They have a bunch of different names um, that you can order online. Some people make them themselves and you drape the skin over it. Um, you sew it into place and then you dry it. And that's the, the taxidermy that you get. The crazy displays that you see at some museums are just because of really, really detailed and beautiful um, mounts that people will make. And so this is Philip Leopold Martin, um, a German who invented this um, really weird moldable plastic that he was able to, in this case, drape a lion uh, skin over. And that's how you make those really lifelike mounts. It, it's all in the, the mold that it goes over. Um, so this is a kangaroo rat, a very, very old, not very good looking one. Um, and you might think that like all the bones and everything are still in there. And if you take an x-ray, there's actually not much in there. There's the skull, there's a little bit of plaster and then wires to hold up the rest of it. And this is probably cotton or maybe straw. Um, I, it, I don't think it's actually plastic, um, but, but that's how um, the majority of taxidermy happens. It's really just a skin um, um, sewn over a, a mold or mount. Um, in natural history museums, the majority of our bird and mammal specimens are laid out in this in characteristic positions and they're stuffed with cotton. And so there are wires that um, hold out the feet and the arms and the tails of all of these wood rats. Um, and then they're all stuffed and shaped the same way. And that's really important so that you can come to the Norris Center, you can measure some characteristic of our specimens, and then you could go to the Smithsonian or to the California Academy of Sciences and look at their specimens and be able to measure exactly the same thing. So there's a, a specific reason that we do this, but for the most part, this is just skin with cotton and then some wire. And then we also keep the, the skulls and sometimes the entire skeletons of the animals as well for other analyses. With importantly, and this is important for you as an at-home taxidermier, um, all of the data about the specimen as well. For you as an at-home taxidermier, um, you would have to be able to prove to Fish and Wildlife Service or US Fish and Wildlife that you collected this thing legally and that you have permission to, to have it. And a good way to do that is to keep a data tag with it. Um, let's see. Yeah, birds are the same way. Again, characteristic position. Um, we do a lot of education, and so um, instead of wires, they have wooden dowels in them, and normally you can cut them off right here, but we let ours stick out so that they're a bit easier to hold, or as Kevin Condon calls them, um, they become birdsicles, which that's okay. I'm okay with that. Um, reptiles, amphibians, and fishes are often fluid stored, which means they get fixed with formalin, and so formalin or formaldehyde um, prevents things from decomposing. Um, it also makes it impossible to extract DNA from, so pluses and minuses. Um, so these um, individuals here are being fixed and then um, they get stored in fluid, in ethanol here. Um, these are not very good examples, but, um, but they will last for hundreds and hundreds of years in this way. And there are positives and minuses, right? Or pluses and minuses, I guess. Um, we can see the internal anatomy of these specimens, but um, sometimes the colors leach over time and they become a bit more brittle. We also can't get DNA from them. Um, they can be freeze dried or stuffed, but that's much less common. Um, so these are from the American Museum of Natural History. And I'm sure all of you know that these are uh, Caribbean rock iguanas in the genus Cyclura. Um, and so back in the 1800s, uh, collectors from the American Museum were out in the Caribbean islands and they were collecting these specimens and they'd send them back. They'd send back the skins um, to the American Museum. And back then they had never seen these specimens before. And they were like, oh my God, these are like terrible, crazy iguanas. We have to put them in really lifelike um, uh, positions where they're like killing things and eating everything. And they're just terrible dinosaurs. And it turns out these are like vegetarian iguanas that like sit on the beach and eat plants. And they taxidermied them pretty inaccurately because they had no idea about their biology. Um, so I thought that was funny to see these cute little iguanas looking all terrifying. Um, arthropods uh, are often dried and then pinned. This is 
in my opinion, the hardest kind of taxidermy or preservation, because um, if it's done right, like these beautiful specimens were, you've got the antennas that you, um, you basically take the insect and pin it in a certain position so that all of its anatomical features are out and then you let it dry in that position. Um, and so here, Randy Morgan took enough care to pull out the antenna, make sure the antenna were um, straight and that the wings were visible. And then here he pinned it differently so that you could see the underside. He also takes great care with the legs and it gets very, very um, minute and very um, detail oriented, which is really hard. Um, plants are pretty easy. They are just pressed and dried um, and um, pressed in a way that you can see all of the, the features of the plant. Um, again, fungi are dried as well. Um, these ones are dried fungi from 1882. You can still get DNA from them. You can still tell some of the morphology of them. It's, it's really useful. Um, you do this with any of your culinary mushrooms as well. Um, there are other methods that we're not going to go into, but that are very, very cool. Um, one is called clearing and staining. And this basically leaches the color out. Um, you basically expose um, specimens, it can be anything really, to a series of chemicals that leach out um, a bunch of color and then add color back in, purple for the uh, bones and blue for the cartilage, but you can clear and stain a bunch of different tissue types. Um, and it just helps you visualize different parts of, um, of the, the specimen. Um, and then those are stored in glycerin. You can take um, slides, like um, slides of a brain or slides of bone, and we can store those in for a really long time. Um, they're skeletonizing, and there's a bunch of different ways to make skeletons, and skeletons are preserved in natural history museums. But again, we're not gonna talk about any of those methods. Um, we're just gonna talk about taxidermy. Um, and I'll just say, people have been thinking about this for a long time, and we've come to get pretty good at preserving things just by removing moisture and keeping things in a dry, dark, um, medium, mediumly humid area. And it works. This is by far the coolest herp specimen I've ever um, held. This is again from the American Museum of Natural History. And this is a gecko. And you can't see it really well in this picture, but you can make out scales on this gecko. You can um, you can identify it to a species or to a genus, Tarantola, and it died in approximately 2000 BC. So this is a 4,000 year old gecko that is very, very well preserved, basically because it was mummified with, um, uh, with someone in Egypt and was kept really dry and really well preserved for 4,000 years. That just, that blew my mind. That was really cool. Okay, um, so let's see if I can finagle this um, new share. Um, so now what I'm gonna do is share with you um, the taxidermy video and, oh, I lost it already. Um, and we'll go through and we'll watch this video. Um, and then at certain points, um, I'll, I'll stop the video and, um, uh, and talk a little bit in more detail. I'll kind of explain what's going on as it happens. Um, and yeah, if you have any questions, um, feel free to put them in the Q&A or in the chat and we can go over them uh, a bit later. Hopefully, I mean, yeah, there should be a decent amount of time at the end. Um, and so this is a video that I prepared a few weeks ago of me taxidermying a acorn woodpecker, which again, you'd need special permits to do, but it does demonstrate um, kind of the, the process of how someone would go about doing this. So starting out, we've got some sawdust to absorb moisture. We've got a tag um, that um, gives us the biodata about where this was found and who found it and when. Um, we've got some water, scissors, um, forceps, a measuring tool so we can take a bunch of measurements um, and some cotton mostly at this point to absorb a mess. Okay, let's go. Um, so I just told you about the materials um, and the metadata. Um, and we'll just pretend I took a bunch of measurements right there, um, like weighing it, like the length, like the wing cord. And now we're gonna make the first cut. And so um, birds don't have feathers everywhere. They have them in feather tracks. And it turns out that there aren't a lot of um, feathers 
in um, along along the center here. So I just used water to spread the feathers apart, and now um, I'm cutting kind of from the belly up to the top of the sternum, just into the skin, not uh, not into the muscle or into the guts or anything. And I'm going to work that skin. Um, I'm going to separate that skin from the muscle and work my way under the skin uh, to basically expose the legs. Leg. Ooh, that turned out well. Um, and uh, yeah, that that is what I'm going to do. And it's going to speed up because it it takes a long time. This bird, for me, and I've done a few of these, still took me like three or four hours to do. Um, things can get a bit bloody, and so the the sawdust is something that animals don't really eat. But um, so if I, if it ends up in the final product, that's fine. Um, ah, look, I found a leg and, um, sorry, that deserves um, a new share um, to make sure you're all up on your bird anatomy. Um, so sorry, the sawdust is good for absorbing messes essentially, and doesn't matter if it gets stuck in there. So basically what we're gonna do here, um, here's a skeleton of the bird. Um, we're gonna take out this body part here. We're gonna leave um, the caudal vertebrae so that the tail feathers can be attached. And we're gonna cut um, through the humerus. We're gonna cut off the, um, the, the femur that's gonna be attached to the body and taken out. And like I said, we're gonna cut through the humerus that's gonna be attached to the body and taken out. And then eventually we're gonna have to take out the neck as well. We'll leave most of the skull in, but um, otherwise it'll be skin plus um, wing bones, um, tail bones, and leg bones. And that's mostly because all of the muscle is kind of contained here in the body of the bird. And there's not much stuff left here at the tail and feet um, for, for something to eat. All right, let's see if I can switch back. Sure. Okay. Um, all right. So now we've cut through um, both the legs. That was quick, right? You can see this little nublet sticking out here. So we're gonna go back through the back and we're basically gonna try to go around the back to, um, to separate the, the rest of the lower body out. And basically what I'm gonna do there is, is cut through the cloaca. And you'll see it in a second here. Um, in case you don't know, the cloaca is kind of the all purpose hole. Um, and there it is. Um, so that's where the excrement comes out. That's also the reproductive um, hole for, for birds. And basically, so I, um, as you can see here, I've exposed underneath the body, the legs are, are detached here. And I'm gonna cut right here so that the cloaca is, stays attached to the skin, but all of the organs and everything else um, stays with the body here, which I will later remove. That's a big cut. Boom. Um, great. Uh, you can see I got some goo on there, but nothing the little sawdust couldn't take care of. Um, okay, so now we're going to work up the body and we're going to expose. Um, oh, just kidding. I'm going to remove the, the muscle on the legs. Um, so uh, the, the, these are the lower legs, the tibiotarsis, kind of, um, you could think of it as like the bird calf muscles. Um, and I'm just removing all the excess muscle from there. And it takes a little while, but pulling the skin down carefully. You don't want to rip the skin um, and you want to keep all those feathers attached. Um, so pulling the muscle away from those leg bones, and then we will be good to, to continue up the body. And then if you pull them out, oh my gosh, you can see crazy woodpecker feet. Um, imagine if you like jammed your, um, I think it's thumb and first finger together. And then, uh, is it first? Yeah. And then um, jammed your, your third and fourth finger together. Like then you would have these weird X-shaped uh, toes that woodpeckers have. Anyway. All right. So now we're going up. We're going to, um, we're just going to pull the skin down away from the body using water to keep it moist, to make sure that the, the skin doesn't rip. And we're going to expose the shoulders um, and like I said, cut through the humerus and then go up and expose the neck, um, so that we can, we can deal with the head. All right. So there you go. You can see I've exposed the shoulder there, which means the humerus is just by my right thumb now. Um, and I'm going around and there you go. So now you can see that's pretty much the junction of the humerus. I'm going to leave a lot of humerus on there. 
Um, and I'm just cutting through to remove it. And it doesn't really matter. Like you can take half the humerus, you can leave half the humerus. I'm leaving the whole thing on because I do think it makes a prettier specimen in the end. Um, okay, so there's the neck. That's another point of attachment. Um, and there's the shoulder. So that's the other shoulder that I have to cut through. And you can see, yeah, that's a joint. Confirm shoulder. I'm just gonna pull the skin down a little bit, expose it, make sure we can like see daylight under there. Ah, we've got daylight, okay. Um, that means, cause you, you don't wanna cut through the skin. Um, the skin is the one thing you really wanna preserve along with the feathers attached to it. Cut that last piece of muscle. Um, and then all that's left is the neck. And I can't remember, ah yes. And so you can see um, in the neck, um, so that um, kind of plasticky cartilaginous thing, that's the windpipe, which is pretty cool. And it goes all the way down. And you can also see the spine. I think I'm pointing out the giant muscles. Um, Oh, right. Yeah, we've removed the two arms, the two legs, and the neck. And so this will officially free the body. Um, so we're cutting through now um, the neck, uh, important um, aorta and uh, veins, esophagus, and the trachea. All right, the body is out. Good job. And that is, if you've ever cooked um, a rotisserie chicken, that's pretty much what you get, minus the arms and legs. Um, Okay, so now we have to go in and remove the muscles from the arms. And I'm just gonna, this can be kind of confusing to look at. So um, I'm, we're gonna go back to our bird morphology sheet. So um, to put this in terms of a chicken, which I find useful, um, this part here, this from, from the humerus down is basically what you eat in a chicken wing. Um, and uh, the humerus has some muscles attached to it. Um, but as you get further out, there are fewer and fewer muscles. And so the ulna has, um, you can see all these little bumps on the ulna. That's actually where the primary feathers attach. So it's like this outside long bone um, here, the primary feathers attach into there. And we don't want to detach them because that makes the feathers, we don't want to detach them from the bone. That makes the feathers like get all ruffled and weird, but we do need to remove that muscle. So that's what I'm gonna do in the next step is remove the muscle from this humerus and then try to remove this radius bone here because that has some muscles attached to it as well. But I'm gonna try to leave this ulna as intact as possible um, so that I don't disturb these um, feather junctions. That just makes things look a bit nicer. It's actually not the biggest deal if they do get detached. Um, again. A lot of personal preference here. Okay, back to the video. So yes, humerus. And so I'm gonna. I need to work this skin down carefully, um, without uh, without messing up those feathers. And so I'm working the skin down. And then as I expose more muscle, um, uh, that was a really strong tendon. That's how birds control um, like things so far away. Like your hands don't have a lot of muscle in them, but they have a lot of tendons. Okay, so now um, I've removed most of the skin and here you can see the insertion of the, um, oh no, where's my mouse? Um, oh, that doesn't really work. Well, you can see the insertion, that's what I'm pointing to. All of those feathers that are under my right hand are inserting into the ulna. And that's, those are the insertions that we want to um, preserve. Um, and actually, I think I said, primaries, but they're actually the secondaries, not the primaries. That's the definition of secondary, is a feather that attaches to the ulna rather than um, the carpometocarpus or, or more distal phalanges. Um, apologies. Yeah, so we're going to go through and try to um, uh, try to maintain those. All right, so now we've exposed a lot and um, you can see there, that's actually one of the feather shafts coming into the ulna. So I'm gonna try not to hit that, but I do want to remove, yeah, that muscle right in there um, and try to remove it as much as possible. So I can try to slide the skin back in on this side, um, but I need to, to keep that muscle um, attached.
No, go away. Sorry, I don't know why. Okay, there it goes. All right, we're removing, removing, removing. All right, so I'm going to cut away the the muscle and take with it the um, the radius as well. Oh, there it comes, and it it often comes in little little bits. And if you have a little bit of muscle left on your final product, it's not that big of a deal. But um, uh, you definitely don't want big chunks because that's what insect. I mean, muscle has um, water in it, which bacteria love to grow on. And then that's also what insects and rats and all sorts of other pests will, will go for. So I'm just right now trying to remove as much muscle as possible. Um, and you can see the feathers are still inserted there to the ulna and the humerus in my hand is clean. And there's my snarge pile, all done. Snarge, oh yeah, there, good job, thank you. Um, snarge is the technical term for your waste products. Okay, um, so that is the completed wing and you can see the feathers are still attached. And so now I think we just skipped over it. Okay, um, so um, you're, we just skipped right over the second wing and um, we're gonna go now up the neck and into the head. Um, so it can help to put a little bit of cotton in the head as well. Um, and that's what I've done there. Oh my gosh, you get to see a cool woodpecker tongue. We'll see it more later. Um, so now this is a very slow and kind of annoying process because bird brains are so big. Um, especially compared to the size of the neck, it's really hard to kind of pull the skin over the top of the head like you would, like you're taking off a sock um, to expose everything up there. And I'm just moving it, like using my scissors to cut the connective tissue away. Now we've exposed the eye. Um, we've, we've cut past the ears already. Um, oh my gosh, what is that? Anyone know? Okay, well, I'll tell you anyway. That is the tongue muscle. So you can see the tongue comes from the bottom of the skull and inserts at the forehead of this woodpecker, which is just insane. Um, okay, we're cutting through the eye. You will see more of that tongue later because it's just amazing. Your tongue inserts like right behind your jaw, no big deal. Woodpecker's tongues insert literally at their forehead. It is just amazing. So I'm trying to preserve the tongue here, but I think I end up messing it up anyway. Um, it has to come out because it's muscle, but it's just cool to see. Um, so we're now just past the eye. You can see um, the ear hole here that's already been exposed. And I'm cutting the connective tissue away from the back of the eye because we're just trying to bring the skin just in front of the eye so we can reach behind the eye and scoop it out. Um, that's where we are. Okay, um, so right, I'm removing the connective tissue that literally attaches to the eyeball, attaches the skin um, to, to the eyelids. And now you can see really the eyeball is in there. Um, and, and once you get that connective tissue away, same as in your eyes, there are a couple muscles in there, but really it's just the retina and nerve. So I reach my curved forceps back, out comes the eye, and I'm gonna just cut a couple of those muscles away, and ta-da, there comes the eye. And um, bird eyes are super cool. There's a, a bony ring inside their eye, which they think helps focus the, um, is how birds focus. Anyway, I pulled out the other eye as well. Bird eyes are super cool, remnant of the dinosaur. Now you can get a better look as well at the uh, muscles. Uh, see, I hit them. Um, but isn't that nuts that, the tongue muscle goes all the way around. All right, so now um, our next goal is to remove all the muscle from, um, from the head, and that includes the tongue. I'm gonna take a little bit of extra time with the tongue because it's just so cool. Um, but we also need to cut around the neck and into the skull to remove the brain. So that's what I'm doing here, cutting a little window. Um, so we're really, we're really like getting inside the head of this acorn, if you will. Oh, uh, just kidding. Um, so, uh, oh man, go away. Thank you. Um, 
So yeah, I just cut a little square and now I'll basically like pull the neck off and pull the brain out. And you can see actually the brain is um, not mush. It's like in pretty good shape. You could just see both lobes that I just destroyed, but um, that's a testament to um, the quality of this specimen. This specimen came from um, Native Animal Rescue and is in really, really good shape. And so thank you, Native Animal Rescue. Um, this was a, a woodpecker that did not make it. Um, so now we're dissecting out um, the jaw muscles, the muscles along the palate. We're scooping out the brains. We're removing the neck, um, scooping out the, the jaw muscles. Oh yeah, check out the tongue. Oh yeah, that's a nasty brain pile and you don't wanna get your feathers in the brain pile. So you're trying to avoid getting your feathers wet at all. Um, and it's really hard to clean them afterwards. So avoid that brain pile. But um, now you can see the tongue. The, Woodpeckers have a hard tip of their tongue as well for getting insects out of hard places, which is just amazing. I think I show it. Um, okay, there you go. So you can see how, um, oh, it's gone. Um, but woodpeckers have really cool tongues, including a really hard tip as well. Um, I can go back, but we're gonna run out of time. Um, da -da 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 -da. Ta -da! Okay, um, so yeah, you can see just how absurdly long this is. Um, from the hard tip here that actually goes in, this part hangs out in its mouth, but you've got all of this elastic muscle that means that all this muscle can stretch and contract from the forehead of the bird, come all the way out, out the mouth and back in. It is just, ah, oh, it's so cool. I, woodpeckers are awesome for that reason and more. Um, okay, there you go. Woodpecker tongues, definitely worth appreciating. Okay, so now um, we've cleaned out the skull. Um, we've removed most of the skin. I'm checking to make sure the eyelids are still intact. Um, and then I'm gonna go through and grab some cotton. And this will really help absorb um, some of the excess goo that's left in there, some of the blood as well, because as we invert or revert, I should say, the skin, we don't wanna um, get any blood on them. We're gonna replace the brain and the eyes with um, pieces of cotton. And you can see I shaped, I kept the eye so that I could shape the um, ball of cotton to be about the same size. Um, all right, so we've stuffed the head here. And now um, uh, we are reverting the skull. And so um, you can see I applied a lot of water to the skin there and that's really to, to keep it moist because this is where you lose feathers. This is where you rip the neck. Um, this is where things, where your bird may turn into a Franken bird. Um, and so, yeah, we're basically going to push it back through like you're rolling a sock up your leg. Um, and it's, it's easier said than done. But now, remember, we've moved, removed all of the, the muscle, all the fat, all the everything um, from the head and replaced it with, excuse me, with cotton. Okay, here it comes. Okay, you can already see the beak there. And we're just gonna kind of push it through, um, trying to get it all lined up so that um, so it's not like twisted or rotated or anything. And then yeah, eventually it comes through and you can kind of freeze it out. Now it probably looks terrible. Um, so the majority of the rest of the time will be floofing, um, which is which is fun. And that is a technical term. So here I'm just adjusting the eyes to try to get them more lifelike, um, like not all lid. Um, and yeah, trying to make them real. Oh, right, um, sorry. Um, so let's go back to our morphology. Um, here we go. And so um, birds have a preening gland and I think I, maybe I don't have it here. Um, well, so below, uh, so now we're looking at the stomach of the bird, but on the other side of the bird is a um, preening gland right here. Um, and that's really, that's like when you see birds like preening themselves, they get oil from this and that helps protect their feathers from wear and from insects and all sorts of cool stuff. But anyway, it's filled with oil and gross compounds. So we need to go in, we need to remove all the muscle from these caudal vertebrae um, and need to um, remove that uropygial gland as well. Um, yeah, so, so that's what we're doing here. And sorry, and I should say, we wanna keep all the tail feathers attached. All the tail feathers attach mostly to this pyga style here. So we need to remove the muscle, but not detach the, um, the feathers from the pyga style. 
Um, so I'll go back to the video and then boom. All right, so that's what we're doing. We're picking the muscle away and I'm, I have to pull the skin down to get access to that gland. Um, and boy, it is a cool gland, I tell you. Um, so I'm just picking the muscles off of those caudal vertebrae and then working the skin down a little bit until I reveal the really obvious um, uropygial gland. And so there it is. You can see it's got two big bulges right there. And then actually it comes to a little tip and I'm just gonna use my tweezers to um, try to remove it. If you pop it, it's not the biggest deal. I definitely popped it. Um, and, but, and that's what cotton is for. Um, and yeah, so I'm just gonna just scrape out that uropygial gland. As you can see, that was a, a two pop. It should be a zero pop, but they're actually hard not to pop um, because the membranes are so thin and they've got so much oil in them already. Okay, so now the next step um, is to make the cotton body. So I'm gonna use this dowel and um, I want it to be about the length of the body um, with a little bit of excess coming out so we can hold it like a bird sickle. And then I'm just gonna um, create these divots in it so that it attaches to the cotton and put a spike on the end as well so that it can um, stick into the cotton that we put in the brain. And that'll kind of be, that'll give this bird the structure that we need. So now we need to, replace the body with cotton. And we're looking to make something about the same size as, um, as the cotton, uh, sorry, as the body. Um, and there are lots of different ways to do this. Like you can lay things vertically, but anyway, you just kind of wrap the cotton around so that it's about the same size. Um, and so now I'm trying to get it to sit really well inside the brain case. Um, and then, I'm gonna have to adjust this cotton so that it all fits in. And um, one thing that um, is maybe not obvious is that you can actually, because of those feather tracks, because the feathers floof up and cover a lot of your mistakes, you don't have to make the, um, you don't have to make the body the exact size. There, there's room for error and you actually want it to be a bit smaller. So because the specimen was so fresh, we can take tissues um, from the inside of the body and um, those will get donated to the Museum of Vertebrate Zoology at UC Berkeley. Um, and that'll be great because afterwards, once this body is gone, we're not gonna preserve the body anymore, but now we'll have a bunch of different kinds of DNA samples. Um, so here we're gonna fill out everything. Um, and obviously it gets an accession number. And um, we have to write all this information on the tubes as well. And then we're gonna go through and dissect the body and we're gonna pull out um, heart, muscle, liver, and kidney. So we can go up and cut around the body. And then, um, so here, oh man, I thought this would be easier to see. Um, so all those shiny dark bits, that's basically liver. So I'm gonna cut, um, it looks like the right lobe of the liver away. Oh, sorry, that was a heart. Um, that shiny dark bit is the liver. So that's the right lobe there. So we've got the heart, we've got the liver. Um, and for the muscle, I'm gonna take a little chunk of breast tissue, heart, liver, muscle. And then the kidneys, like on your kidneys, are actually back towards the back. Um, oh boy, that's hard. Um, so those are the two um, um, bronchial tubes that go to the two lungs. Um, and now um, that black stuff, I promise you, is actually kidney. Um, and then every time I open a bird, it, it doesn't happen often anymore. I'm like, oh my gosh, look at this white thing. Isn't that crazy? Maybe it has eggs. Um, it turns out that's the crop and I always mistake it. Don't, don't make that mistake. Um, but it's the crop. It was full of seeds and cool, fun stuff. Um, so here we're looking for the gonads as well. Birds obviously have internal gonads. Um, and if we go back, um, they're extremely hard to see, um, especially when they're not breeding. So basically like um, males have one testes, usually the right in passerine birds that will get much expanded um, during the breeding season. But when it's not the breeding season, they'll shrink down to be super small. So this was a male and it had um, just tiny little nodules right above the kidney um, that were, it's, it's very small testes. Um, and so that's what I was looking for to confirm there. I don't need to take a sample of them, but um, uh, I need to confirm the, the sex of this bird. 
Um, so now I'm gonna take um, little pieces of the heart, muscle, uh, liver, and kidney, and they go in the tube, the tube goes in the freezer. Okay, um, now you come back and you're like, whoa, 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 what happened to that bird? Oh my God. And you're right, a lot of magic happened. Um, and that's probably the, the hardest part and takes the most patience is floofing the bird. How much time we got? Two minutes, cool. Um, so tricks there are um, get some water and um, you can kind of brush all the goo and gunk off with like a little toothbrush and water. Um, you can put a drop or two of like blue dial soap if you've got some like oils or fats in there to get off and then sit with a cool hair dryer or an air blower and just floof the, the feathers, like get them to fluff back up and to look normal. And feathers are just such incredible structures that when, um, when they uh, are wet, they get all munch, scrunched down and can look kind of ugly. But once you floof them back up, they look nearly normal. So this bird has been mostly floofed. I'm gonna do a few um, touch-ups here and there um, and use, again, just trying to keep it dry. Um, and you can see, even though that body is like smaller than, um, or is a bit uh, smaller. And so here I'm like taking cotton off of the, the actual body and stuffing it back into the chest to give it a bit more dimension in the chest. Um, but again, it doesn't have to like stuff the bird completely because um, you'll sew it back up and the feathers will, um, will cover it. And so, um, burp. So now a couple more um, materials are needed. Um, uh, the pins, um, cotton thread, and um, needle. Okay, so we're gonna write all the data information down, I think, and then we're gonna sew it. Um, I might just let this play so that we can get to questions. All right, data label, don't forget your data label. So if you stick an unlabeled bird in my hood, I'm gonna be very angry with you. Um, and that's true, you should like always keep the information associated. Um, so here we've got some styrofoam, styrofoam so that we can like pin the bird in place and that's about it. All right, so we're writing the data labels down. That'll be the final label and that gets pinned in place. And then, yeah, we're just gonna sew it up not too close to the edges. Um, and it's really, really simple. You want to go from the underside and then, um, and then yeah, tie a knot down at the end. And you can see, like, even though there's this gaping hole there, if you just kind of readjust the feathers, it covers up that hole pretty well. So technically, you should tie the feet in, um, in a cross over, um, this is to prepare a museum specimen, um, and tie the data label on. So now I'm tying the feet together. Um, Et voila. And now I'm going to pin the bird in place. And so this, um, once it dries in this way, the skin will be dried and there's no going back. You cannot move it without ripping the skin. So I'm going to um, pin it in exactly the way that I want. I'm going to set the beak at 45 degrees here with some string, um, cover it in cotton to, to keep the feathers from, from going all out of whack and then leave it for two weeks you know, um, out to dry. And after two weeks, it will be done. It will be a complete museum specimen. Um, et voila, that is the bird. Whew, okay, um, so, oh no, we're not starting that over. I'm gonna stop sharing. Um, and in like the last six minutes, um, we can go over any questions that you all have. Um, awesome. Thank you so much, Alex. I was just smiling the whole time. I thought that was so interesting. Um, and we've, uh, at the museum, we've talked about wanting to have a demo like this for years. So I'm cool. excited. So thank you. Um, and we have had a number of questions. Um, some of them are kind of more technically about process. Um, so I, maybe I'll start with that. Um, we're curious about the moisture content. And so you're talking about using sawdust to help um, absorb some of that moisture, but then you're also using cotton to stuff it and just curious about how the cotton kind of maybe holds on to some of that moisture and if that's a concern. Um, it is, but um, so like, yeah, you don't want to, 
you want the bird to be mostly moisture free when you actually stuff it full of cotton. Um, but the idea is that hopefully um, the, the moisture is, will evaporate during the drying process as well. And so, whereas like if you leave a chunk of muscle in there, it's really hard for, um, for the moisture way down at the center of that chunk of muscle to evaporate off. Whereas like from the edges of the cotton or the residual moisture in the, um, in the skin of the bird, that's, that's not that big of a deal. Yeah. Um, I guess even the eyes are like, they're exposed to the air. So that would probably dry up. Right. Right. Exactly. And, um, and yeah, you're, you're trying to remove as much of it as possible before you do that, um, that final stuff essentially. And then the skin is just, you don't have to do anything to the skin at all. It just kind of desiccates in a way that doesn't rot. And correct. That's correct. Exactly. There's, there's not much left in it. And bird skin is, is pretty, um, uh, thin as well. It's not like, like a chicken that you buy at the store that has a lot of fat in it. Um, it's pretty thin. There's not much left and yeah, it will just, um, desiccate away. You don't, because you're okay with it shrinking down as it desiccates, you don't have to salt it or do anything else to, um, to prevent it from doing that. And if you were trying to create a, um, a, a preserved specimen on a mold where it's looking mm -hmm. more lifelike, would you take different care um, um, so that it won't shrink and... You, you don't. Um, the one thing that you'll need to do is make a mold that's slightly smaller than the real live sized um, animal mm -hmm. because you're going to one, need to fit that skin around it. And then two, that skin is going to contract onto the mold as it dries. And so you need to, to compensate for that, essentially. Mm -hmm. It's like a very small amount of like shrinkage, but, um, but it does happen. Yeah. And another kind of technical question that came up was about um, someone noticed that you weren't wearing gloves. And um, I'm sure a lot of us have been told, like, if you spot a dead bird, like, don't touch it because it may um, have diseases. Uh, is that something that you consider? Um, I, you definitely want to be, um, like, you don't want to be, like, eating or licking your fingers or anything like that. Um, but for the most part, birds don't really have diseases that we can catch in terms of bloodborne pathogens. Um, I, if I were working on a raven or a crow or a pigeon, something that has probably been in human trash and might be eating like human or mammal remains, I might um, take more precautions. But for a bird that mostly eats ants and acorns, I'm not very worried about um, catching any diseases from it. Um, that kind of leads me into another question that I had, which was about the fact that we're watching you work on a bird specimen. And I know from like firsthand experience partnering with the Norris Center that you work on a lot of bird specimens um, mm -hmm. primarily. Maybe could you speak as to like why that is A and then B, um, maybe if you have experience working on other classes of animals and what that's like. And maybe like another thing I noticed is that you have to know a lot about the anatomy of the specimen that you're working on to know like where the gland is and, and how things work and why you want to, um, you know, be careful in this area because it'll impact the feathers. Um, there's a lot of uh, nuances there, which are really interesting, but so could you speak a little about working on other, other types of animals? Sure. Yeah. Um, I probably have the least amount of experience working on mammals, um, but uh, we mostly work on birds because um, that's just what comes in to the Norris Center most often. People um, find dead birds and, excuse me, um, and bring them into us and, and we'll take those donations if they're in, if they're good quality, if they're not rotting, if you know where you found it, no um, when you found it, um, we'll take those. Um, but, but yeah, we'll, we also have a box of taxidermy waiting for us for, um, of, of mammals and of herps and all that stuff. Um, and the process is pretty similar, um, for mammals. For mammals, you'll also take the skull completely out because it's really important for identification and you'll basically create, um, you'll wrap in wire a, a cotton mold of the mammal and you'll stick wires through the feet and 
Um, so like basically up through here and through the arm to hold those out. Same with the tail and the hind feet as well. Um, and then, um, and yeah, you, you'll put like a, a wire through the spine, I believe, to, to kind of keep the structure. Um, but, but that's about it. Um, herps are totally different because they kind of just get fixed with formalin, like you inject formalin in them. That holds them in their characteristic position, and then you can fluid store them. Um, and yeah, insects are, are more complicated. Um, are birds your preference then, or is that mainly because um, of your experience with them? I, I know them. I feel the most comfortable with them. I want to get better at mammal taxidermy, but um, yeah, birds are, well, I would say herps are the easiest for sure. Um, and I've done a jillion of those, but um, birds I'm still working on. And, and it's just fun because they come in so many different shapes and sizes. So like a woodpecker is way different than doing like a crane, which is way different than a sparrow and different than like a pigeon. And they all have these weird quirks about them, like woodpeckers, their tongues and like owls have these giant eyes and like, um, yeah, they all have these little quirks in their anatomy that are fun to, to watch out for. Yeah, it seems like a great way to um, to really get to know these different specimens and to um, be tuned into those differences. It's really it is it it definitely is yeah. Um, also, I'm just curious how you got into this uh, preserving specimens in this way. Um, I always kind of like collected things as a kid. It was mostly like things that I had found. Um, but then I did my graduate work at um, UC Berkeley at the Museum of Vertebrate Zoology there and um, learned how to fix um, uh, or how to preserve reptiles and amphibians that way and collected a few specimens during my times. And I was like, yeah, curious how they get these specimens to last for so many years. Like, what do they do? And so it was like working in the museum, I picked up a few more things, but then it was really at the Norris Center where I learned from Chris how to do birds and kind of applied it from there um, that, that I learned more about it. And again, at the Norris Center, we also have over 17,000 plants. And so I learned the nuances of like what makes a good plant specimen or a bad plant specimen and all the things you need there. Um, still haven't worked on insects because boy, I'm just, it's so tiny. Like you need like giant magnifying glasses on your head. And like, I, I'm scared to work on insects, but I want to. Um, and yeah, I've just been, just been picking it up from there as a hobby. It's really, really nice to be connected to a museum or to have museums in our community. Um, and I should say we do take in non COVID times, we take volunteers if you want to learn, um, because they, they facilitate this kind of learning in a kind of safe environment where you don't have to break any laws and mm -hmm. you can have all the protections that you need and all of that. Yeah, and that you did mention that you receive donations from from people. Um, yeah. Do you have any guidance for for that? For if someone does find, um, say, a barn owl on the side of the road, what would your recommendation be in that? Um, essentially, if you can smell it already and it smells rank, it's too far gone for taxidermy, and we probably won't end up keeping it. Um, or if you see like maggots and flies and stuff around it. But if it's really fresh, um, make a note of when you found it and precisely where you found it, like drop a pin on your cell phone, um, write that information down, store it in your freezer, and then send us an email and we'll, we'll gladly take it off your hands. Um, because remember, you can't legally keep those things. You could keep it if you said you were bringing it to the Norris Center, but you couldn't keep a barn owl, for example, but, but we could, and it would be a really cool data point as well. Um, and yeah, the same is true for mammals or reptiles and amphibians that you find. Um, we'll gladly take them. We do need like your name, where it was found and when it was found for it to be useful. Um, and yeah, we also get a lot of donations from native animal rescue. So if people bring injured things into native animal rescue and they don't make it, um, they now keep a lot of uh, specimens for us and, and uh, um, bring them up to the North Center. So again, if you're bringing something to Native Animal Rescue, tell them when and where you found it um, so that if it ends up at the North Center, we have those data as well. Okay.
Great. And I'll, um, in the chat here is the website for the Norris Center too, for if anyone's interested in that. Um, also, someone was curious about um, taxidermying, if that's the right verbiage, uh, a pet. Do you have any mm -hmm. information about that? Um, I don't have any like positive information. I am 99% sure it is okay to do. Um, essentially because you have permission to, you, you own this animal. I don't like to say that, but, but you do. Um, so yes, if you would like to, you could do it. Um, I bet Gurney would do it for you. Um, and definitely other um, taxidermy organizations that cater more to hunters, they definitely do um, pets as well. Or yeah. you could give it a shot yourself. <laughs> yeah. Um, and speaking of hunting, someone did early on was curious about, um, we were talking about like the legality of which animals are um, under which purview laws, regulations, migratory birds versus others. Um, and the BLM just released their plan for the Chitoni Coast Dairies property um, around Davenport. And it includes a provision about hunting. Um, and I can just say that I um, have looked through the plan and it's, I believe it's limited to, um, to archery and um, will likely be certain non-native animals like for mm -hmm. types of, of hunting abilities there. Do you have anything else to add about that? Um, I don't know anything specifically about it. Um, I did hear that, that pig hunting would be available, um, which is great because pigs are a giant nuisance and, and a pain, especially in those coastal grasslands. Um, and yeah, um, BLM land is, is generally very hunting friendly. Um, I know someone else asked about, um, small game. Um, it's yeah, the same rules apply. You can get, you can get a hunting license for it. And, um, and those are, those are legal to practice. Yeah, so I guess that would be another, another aspect of being able to collect animals as if it's under certain hunting regulations. Yeah. Um, exactly. And someone else just shared too uh, with experience from working with Gurney that he has a policy of not accepting pets like dogs and cats. Yes. Thank you for <laughs> that. That is important <laughs> and good to know. Um, well, thank you so much for this, Alex. And thank you to everyone who um, who's joining us today. I'm going to put in the chat also a link to a survey, which I'll also be sending out an email um, shortly that will have that. We'd love to hear your feedback um, on how this went for you and what else you'd like to see um, from the Santa Cruz Museum of Natural History as well as from the Norris Center. And, um, and also if you would like to become a member of the Santa Cruz Museum of Natural History, if you are not already and help us continue to offer programs like that, there's a link for membership. Um, and I'll also include some links for the Norris Center within our follow-up. Um, but thank you so much, Alex, for this and um, hope you enjoy North Carolina. And um, also one other thing I wanted to share with everyone was uh, we have a lineup of events uh, this whole week that are um, similarly themed as macabre um, for our entire Museum of the Macabre lineup. So um, you can join us tomorrow. We're gonna have um, uh, two geologists who we work with regularly talking about caves. And then on Thursday, Christian Schwarz, who also works with the Norris Center, um, will be presenting on macabre mushrooms. There's also some activities that we've prepared um, on that webpage. So if you're looking for other things to add to your Halloween lineup, um, head on over there. So again, thank you. See ya. Yeah, thanks for having me. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.